And therefore to connect those two together, the five universals with the levels at which they are preserved and promoted, uh, this is the way, the correct way, the, the most consistent way to look at them. There is another way to look at them, but that will lead to certain yani, incoherence and inconsistency. And that is each one of these, as I said, is to be preserved and promoted at those three levels. Level of daruriyat or the essentials, the level of the conveniences of the need or the hajiyat, and the level of the embellishments or the beautifies, I'm going to call it B. Each one of them is protected at that same level. Is this understood? And I gave at least some examples pertaining to, to, to each, uh, to some of these here. When I say aqidah is of the essentials, um, extra dhikr of Allah Azza wa is of the conveniences, for example, tahara is of the embellishments and the beautifiers. Similarly, for the nafs, the preservation of the nafs, air and the freedom to walk is, is an essential, uh, the, your hand and so on is an essential, uh, and so on. Doing sports uh, or, or food or eating food and having enough food, huh? having enough food is a convenience, having enough food is a convenience, having some food is essential, having dessert, you know, <laughs> it depends, right? <laughs> and, then, and then embellishments for the nafs, such as uh, for the preservation of the nafs, such as what? Certain type of clothes and certain types of perfumes and, 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 and certain types of relationships. Now, this will lead me naturally to talk about another fundamental concept in Islamic law and the objectives of Islamic law, and that is the concept of priorities. Al-Awlawiyyat. Priorities or Al-Awlawiyyat. In its systematic Shari'i approach, uh, Sharia and our Fuqaha, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, when they face issues and they deal with issues, that which we have here outlined in front of you is not just chaotic, then there's this next classification, so that the mind of a scholar is very methodical. Step by step, and all of this should take place in his or her mind very naturally. And that is, on any issue, especially when we are faced with a complex problem of finding the better solution, or the only solution between two possible, or three, or seven possible solutions. Number one. Or when certain interests, certain benefits, certain masalih somehow uh, seem to seem to and appear to be uh, competing with each other. Which one does the law intend to promote and as an ultimate solution? That's when the question of priorities comes about. What if the question about, okay, I have, I have a house, I own a house, and I have a neighbor next to me, and I have many neighbors to, next to me, and I want to sell my house, and some of my neighbors are concerned about who comes to live in that house. What does the law say about this? Because the law has to weigh now in priorities about 
my privacy, my liberty, my needs. And also now it has to be weighed apparently because of neighborhood community relationships and so on and rights. It has to weigh also the rights, if any, of the neighbors. Many of us wonder and think it is, this is unjust. That's not how scholars think. We want to build a masjid in a neighborhood. And then the neighbors come, we have the right to say something about this. We want or we don't want this masjid here. We want this property to be sold to these Muslims or to be sold to some, to one of us. That's a very legitimate question and a very Islamic approach. And that's called in Sharia, the Shufa concept. The Shufa, Shufa concept. And the Shufa right. Which means, generally, under normal circumstances, your neighbors have more right in that property, if they want to buy it, than anyone else outside of the neighborhood. And the question is, of course, is about weighing the harm and the benefit at the level of those universals. And in accordance to these levels as well. The matter is, has a text in it about it anyways by Rasulullah but the analysis of it is very beautiful and very interesting. Nevertheless, when we come to this question of priorities, I think you can already, if I ask you, if I give you a homework, not a homework, an exercise right now, and use your, your, your logical sense of things, of what daruriya means, as we explained, and what this means, and what this means, which one takes priority among these three um, levels, if we were to choose one of them and we cannot have all together? Obviously, Daruri yet. Because if there is no Daruri for life, there is no life, at least in the legal sense. Of course, we all know if I tell you, La Qaddar Allah, someone comes and tells you, uh, well, uh, you either allow me to, to cut your head or cut your hand. And there is no other recourse except one of these two solutions. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. He's my hand. Of course, you don't do like that one was, was held up by this, by this criminal. And he tells him, your life or your purse. He says, my life. <laughs> you know? Your life or your purse. Common sense requires what? His purse, because life is more valuable than the purse. Life is more valuable than money. Life is more valuable than property. And it will be haram. You will go to hell, wal'iyadu billah. That's at the deen level. Not at the enforceable part on this earth. But at the deen level, if you tell him, take my, cut my head for that purse, you will go to hell. Because you didn't keep that purse. You, you, you were killed. <laughs> So daruriyat goes before hajiyat because the absence of daruriyat implies the absence of the asl of the thing itself, of the very, um, of the very origin of the thing, of the very root of the thing. But the absence of the haji, if it is absent, it makes that thing difficult and hard, not impossible. And of course, between the Haji and the Tahsini, which one takes precedence? Haji. Why? Because the Tahsini is about beautifying and embellishing, and the Haji is about removing hardship. It is about removing hardship. If I tell you, for example, okay, this is, there is this beautiful piece of clothing, and some people like a lot of beautiful clothing, and na'im, and soft clothing, etc., but it is so beautiful that if you wear it, you're going to develop a skin disease. And he says, no, no, I, I want that cloth. <laughs> I 
want that robe or I want that suit or I want that shirt. This is not a reasonable person. This is not a person who thinks in terms of maslaha, in terms of any rational concept of, of benefit and well-being. Because being sick is, is hardship. He says, well, I'm, I'm going to be sick and I, I can live with this, with this scratch for the rest of my life. Uh, it's okay, but I like the way I look outside. That's, that's violating this. That's uh, taken in a uh, tahsini at the level of, ha uh, at the expense of haji. And that is abath. That is abath that sharia is exalted from having. And therefore the order is certainly in this way. I'm sorry. The order is certainly this one. If on any issue Muslim scholarship is faced with having to make a choice between preserving and protecting the daruri or any one of these two, then this is the order of priority. That's a rule of logic and of law and of God. Now. I will kind of come to that in a moment. Inshallah. Let's first understand this. Khair, is this understood? You understand it very well. You just have to think about it, alhamdulillah, absorb it, reflect on it, and see what examples fall underneath it. And you know, this is not only good for jurists and scholars, this is good for every Muslim in your everyday life. Not in law, because Sharia, remember, permeates every aspect of life at, at, in family life wallahi al-azim in personal life when you walk in the street when you when you play when you everything falls under this analysis and you would be making decisions daily and hourly on the basis of these concepts in your everyday life not only when you're a jurist because this is sharia we don't move if we are conscious of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except by that which is consistent with the maqsad, with the intent of the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now having said that, the next thing is here. Let us look at these now, these five universals. If I have a problem, an issue that I face, and in which I have to make a decision about a priority. And we say priority, which means I cannot do both at the same time. That's what we mean, I have to choose one. But if I can do two good things at the same time, then I should do the two good things at the same time. But when we speak of priorities, is which one takes precedence if doing them both together will lead to something of harm. And we'll talk more about that also. Which one takes precedence, deen or nafs? Nafs. Nafs, okay. Which one takes precedence, nafs or aql? Nafs. Nafs. Huh? Is that what you said? Which one takes precedence, aql or nasl? Nasl? Aql? Okay. Which one takes precedence, nafs or mal? Nafs. Nasl, progeny or property? Nasl or progeny? <laughs> okay. Which one takes precedence, deen or nafs? Nafs, deen. Nafs or deen. Okay, let me, let me, let me, because this is not by democratic choice. <laughs> Why did you say nafs? Because if you don't have nafs, you can't practice Very good. Why did you say deen? Because a person, why do people die shahada? Is because they sacrifice 
Very good. Who is right? <laughs> Both are right in a certain context. And I'll show you why. That's where E and C and B come in handy. See, all of you were thinking only that this issue is, is only in one context and you didn't even define the context in your minds. Each one defined it differently. What you said is very right, what you said is very right. If we have a Deen matter that is essential and a Nafs matter that is essential, now let me give you a simpler example. If I have a Deen matter that is convenience and a Nafs matter that is essential, then you are right. then the nafs takes precedence over the deen. Yet you know you've heard this deen takes over precedence over nafs. That's an inaccurate shari statement. And many people base themselves simply on this, on this, uh, many people in fatawi and, in, and in, in getting into very serious things globally also, and other things, may base themselves that on the false notion non-scholarly notion that deen takes precedence over nafs just like that. A convenience of deen and an essential of life. <coughs> Definitely the essential of life takes precedence. Definitely. No doubt about that. You can find tons of examples. A matter of convenience of deen, like, for instance, what did we say earlier? Wudu is we say it was tahsini. But let's take tahsini. Okay, let's take, it doesn't matter, it's deen and tahsini. It's tahara. So, uh, here is somebody who deprives you from tahara. He says, either you stop this wudu or I kill you. He says, my deen teaches me <laughs> that you go ahead and kill me because deen is to be protected. MashaAllah, this person means well. <laughs> but that's not what his deen taught him actually. That's what he thought his deen taught him. Obviously. Well, uh, this deen, yes, we all laughed because this deen does not do laughing things. And it is well established that if someone comes and says to you, you reject God. You either say there is no God at all or I cut your head. Then, wrong. <laughs> wrong. Who says so? Allah and His Rasul. Allah and His Rasul both say so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nahl, I believe. Adullah mishtar. La ilaha illallah. The ayah is escaping me. Um, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ the, the part before that is, is escaping my, my memory. And that is exactly on the occasion of when Ammar ibn Yasir رضي الله تعالى عنهما was tortured and he was forced to reject Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and Tawheed أُعْلُهُ بَلْ you know that that story. And under that pressure, he finally succumbed and said what they wanted him to say. And when he survived, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, then came Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to see what had happened. And, and Ammar said he, he couldn't look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after that. He could not look at him. He was so afraid that he committed an 
awful crime. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu told him, How was your heart when you said that? He said, Ya Rasulullah, my heart was at peace with Allah and His Messenger. Then Rasulullah Sallallahu smiled and he said, Fa'in aadu fa'ud. He said, if they do that again, do the same thing again. If they do that again, do that same thing again. As long as your qalb is at peace. This is an essential of aqeedah to reject because alhamdulillah, look at the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he said the most essential part of the deen, he said it in the heart. Nobody can take it from you. Unless you deliberately and voluntarily give it up. Because it's in your heart. Nobody has access to your heart except Allah Azza wa So that's an essential of the deen. In order to preserve an essential for life, Sharia gave you the right in this case to preserve life. Because without preserving life, you cannot <coughs> preserve the deen. Without preserving life, you cannot preserve the deen in this global sense of the term. As long as your qalb is at peace. And this is two essentials together. This is at the juz'i level, as it is called. It is at the juz'i level, at the specific level, at the level of individuals and so on. However, if you, it becomes a kulli level, it becomes a, it becomes a collective question and answer, and you have this other authority and power that says all of you Muslims of this country, you either say the word of kufr or we kill you all, or we will invade your country and we will kill you all. What's the solution in this case? The solution in this case is the God-given right to defend that now essence and that collective um, that collective belief and that collective right. Some scholars would say, what if you know for sure that all of you will be exterminated? Then say what they want and in your heart it is at peace. And then you work so that they won't do that to you. If it is a matter of aqidah, if it's a matter of inside of you. Or others would say, of course you will fight in the course, in the, in the sake of that, and Allah Azza wa will bring you, inshallah will help and will bring victory. If, uh, however, in combating this, this, this hostility, in combating this, this, uh, th this crime of depriving you from the freedom of your deen, will probably, alhamdulillah, lead to some positive results or will preserve the deen, then of course it becomes mandatory to preserve the deen by giving some lives. And when we say giving deen over life, that's what we mean. We don't mean that you give all of life until no one is left and therefore the deen is gone. That's not what they mean when they say deen takes precedence over nafs, it is with these details. And therefore, if someone stands on a pulpit, speaks about the deen, and says things that he likes and he feels very strong about, or she feels very strong about, and the consequences, the pro uh, we, uh, that's, we'll, we'll talk about it later actually, but let me say it here. And the consequences of those words will be detrimental and hurtful to the lives of others, to the properties of others, to the families of others. And that's haram to do. And that's haram to do. It's, it's unnecessary to do. We shall talk about that with more details later, inshallah ta'ala. Because you're not going, instead of, you say, well, this is a freedom of speech, and, 
and uh, it's a matter of deen and so on in my words that I'm going to say are going to violate this an essential or, of nafs or a uh, uh, haji of nafs and my speaking my speaking about it is what? is it a daruri? it's usually a tahsini speaking about it it's usually a tahsini spe- or at the most a haji did Allah say in the Quran that you have to speak on pulpits? Did He say that this is an essential of deen? Part of our deen is to be speakers? No. So a person who stands and speaks and says things that will cause to harm this or this or this or this while it is a matter of tahsiniyat and it is violating any essentials or higher levels of any of these that is not allowed in shara. And that's, that's not the approach of Islamic scholarship. As we shall demonstrate even further later. So, the priorities now, besides the priorities of E above C above B, now when we connect each one, with these, the matter becomes a little more complex. The matter becomes very interesting in analysis, very challenging in some issues. Is this understood, at least in, and in the global picture of it? Let's say again a specific example. A person comes on a pulpit and says his opinion, an opinion that he holds in the name of freedom of speech, and says, well, well, well. I believe that the only solution in America is jihad in America. This has happened before September 11th, years before. Besides the fact that that's fiqhi wise wrong, it's wrong and inaccurate and unscholarly. Okay, he said that, he wants to go to jail maybe, Maybe he even feels that he wants to be killed. What are the consequences of that word by a person like that on the lives of thousands of Muslims in America? On the properties of thousands of Muslims in, in America? On some aspects of the freedom of deen expression in America? All of those, when it comes to priorities, to those they either fall, some of them in haji, some of them in tahsini, some of them in daruri, while speaking such a word, even if it were true, let's assume it for that, for that um, purpose to be a true statement, which it is not. If it were a true statement, speaking about it on a pulpit, is it Taruri of Deen? Is it Haji of Deen? Is it Tahsini of Deen? In my view, it's not even Tahsini of Deen. It has nothing to do with Deen as such. It has to do with probably Aql somewhere here. It's an opinion that I hold and, and express in it. I, it's a Tahsini of Aql. Is it Tahsini of Aql? How could that be weighed with essentials of nafs and of needs of nafs and of tahsinat of nafs and of essentials of mal? For example, if you have an issue to weigh between a tahsini of deen and an essential of mal, which one takes precedence? We've already established that essential, all darurat takes precedence over all tahsinat of any type. 
So the of mal takes precedence over tahsini or of haji of deen. That's an agreed upon kulliya, that's an agreed upon axiom amongst Muslim jurists. When we come to say every nation has the right to defend itself and it sends its own children to die for the greater well-being of the nation because the greater well-being of the nation takes precedence over losing some of the lives of some of its people, which is a true statement, but oftentimes it's abused. It's not actualized properly. That same, in analogy to that same principle, I would say, that's when our scholars say the, uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, mandatoriness sometimes under some conditions of the combative aspect of jihad in order to defend the deen. Lose of life to defend essentials of the deen. And then when they say that, they say that of course with what we have explained uh, earlier that some loss of life to preserve essentials of deen indeed. Not all loss of life, because if it's all loss of all life, there is nothing that was preserved. Because you need a soul and a body to actualize that deen in life. That's why Allah sent messengers to living human beings. He didn't send Muhammad وسلم, to dead human beings. No, no, please, I'm, I'm not really being sarcastic. I just am repeating these things so that uh, hopefully you understand the juristic language in, in real language, in simple language. It's an often committed mistake by many, many students of ilm, let alone by regular people. And that sometimes could be very destructive and very dangerous. Our scholars, our scholars, rahimahullah ta'ala, do not make such unnecessary, unnecessary mistakes. And similarly, between nafs and aql, if there is a matter of aql that is daruri, and a matter of nafs that is haji, which one takes precedence? Daruri aql, the daruri to, the, the, to preserve the aql, and so on. The rule is that Daruri takes over always the Haji and the Tahsini. And then, depending on, 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 on each level here, then uh, if they are equal, if they are equal, uh, if we deal, let's say, with the Haji in Deen and Haji in Nafs, under normal circumstances and properly understood, which one takes precedence? Lean. If we have Daruri of Deen and Daruri of Nafs, under normal circumstances, the Daruri of Deen, I'm sorry, the Deen takes precedence over the Nafs, if they are of the same level. Similarly, if they are of the same level, the Nafs takes precedence over the Aql. If they are of the same level, the Aql takes precedence over the Nafs, except some scholars, I think Imam Al-Ghazali, I believe, who had it reversed, Nafs takes precedence over Aql. But most of them it is aql taking precedence over nisl and nisl taking precedence over al-mal if they are of the same level. And it takes sometimes of course a lot of practice and, and study and, and experience and, uh, and alhamdulillah, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to very easily distinguish when we have a case where it falls. This takes training and training and training and so on. These are some of the most, of course, uh, involved and complex issues that the jurists and the judges and the lawyers deal with. Uh, it is not something that is uh, easily perhaps discernible or actualizable by just every... Uh, Muslim, no matter how educated they may be in other fields.
what if we have an issue um, how do I describe it? Mm. What about we have, if we have an issue in the two issues in the same compartment? Let's say an issue of uh, property. An issue, two issues, both of property. How do we know which one takes precedence? Now, depending on where, what the level of it is. Is it in in E, C, or B? What if we have two issues in property and they're both in the same level? Yes. Do you see what the consequences of each other? Such as? If they both cause harm, which one will cause the most harm? Very good. More specifically? They look at it this way, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now, the next point, the next step after that is the impact of each one of them. How many people does it involve? That harm or that benefit that it produces at the level that they both share, let's say, at the level of haji. How many people in each case are involved in that benefit or that harm, right? If you have two issues, same problem, same uh, level, it's a matter of property, and if we give judgment to this side or this side, it's the same thing as property, it's the same level of harm or benefit, same thing. But then, how many are on this side? 20, and on this side, 5. 20 will benefit if we give judgment to side A, and 5 only will benefit if we give judgment to side B. Without causing harm and all of that. There are many more detailed analyses. Then which one takes precedence? The one that serves 20, over the one that serves 5. Then you're going to say, what if they are both 20 and 20? What do you do? The next thing perhaps you'll ask your question, is this benefit that is talked about in both cases, how realistic it is or how fictitious it is? How probabilistic it is, in other words. That's the next analysis. How wahmi or how haqiqi it is. That's the next part of the analysis. Then, of course, which one takes precedence? The more probabilistic to occur will take precedence in the analysis. And here comes, here we realize, especially nowadays, that sometimes on fiqh issues, you need a real, real thorough study and analysis, which is many times not done at all. We're still doing sometimes things, yes, in the old-fashioned ways, when they were using tools and mechanisms to compile the data, when now we have other tools that help us to compile the necessary data to make a judgment many times, oftentimes, that is not done in fiqh research. You may find a very new issue and uh, you please your sheikh or scholar or teacher, what is your opinion on this issue? And it's a very new issue, never occurred before. Mm, is the answer. <laughs> Especially if issues are very complex. Okay, now is it halal for us to eat meat or not because of the mad cow disease problem? I think Matt Gaul it's halal or it's haram. This 
needs a lot of research to be able to go through all of those processes to come to a final conclusion. It's not as simple as it seems. The Islamic systematic approach of legal analysis is unique. It's very beautiful. It's very powerful. It becomes, as if I tell you more, and perhaps we'll have one few more minutes, uh, it's, just, it's, just, uh, it's just wonderful. It minimizes the probabilities of speculative reasoning. See how rational it is, yet very beautiful. It, it's very beautiful as well. It, it cares about the purpose, it cares about the spirit of the law, it cares about the harm, it cares about the, the benefit. And therefore I can now add that in Islamic law there is nothing that is haram except if, it, if its harm outweighs its benefits. There is nothing prohibited in Islam if its benefits are more than its evil or its, uh, or, or its wrong or its harm. Never shall you find such a thing in the decrees of Allah or of Rasulullah And if a Muslim scholar, like Ibn Qayyim said earlier, comes with a solution of an issue, and in which there is more harm than benefit, at the level of these universals and their levels and this type of analysis, then that cannot be a Shari solution. It is rejected as a Shari solution. That's what he means. You will never find Sharia law saying or requiring to do something as mandatory and you don't find that its benefit outweighs its harm as a consequence. It's never such a thing. Never. Is there benefit in alcohol? That is consumption of wine, you know, alcohol, intoxicants. No. Uh, the Quran calls it khamr, that which veils and intoxicates. Uh, we people call it, uh, you know, wine and liquor and, and give it nice and beautiful names. Can you imagine someone says, let's go have a glass of intoxicant. <laughs> SubhanAllah. See how we fool ourselves? Why don't you call it what it is? Let's go intoxicate ourselves. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Well, actually now, you know, some young people say, when you, you, you all go to school, most of you, in college, let's go get wasted. SubhanAllah. And then, the more use of that, it became natural and it becomes acceptable. And you don't see the ugliness in the term and the danger and the threat in the term, let's go get wasted. And the other guy, yeah, let's go get wasted. <laughs> and they literally go get wasted. And many times, by the tens of thousands every year, they literally get wasted. 25,000 Americans die each year due to accidents by drunk drivers. Just, that's only car accidents, where people are literally wasted. 20, it was at one year 27,000, 27,000, when it decreased to 23,000, they were so happy. Wow, we, we improved. Can you imagine a country invading America and killing 27,000 Americans each year? Nuked out of the face of the earth. True or false? Look where we are, subhanAllah. Look at the rahmah of this deen, the beauty of this law. Now I was saying, does khamr has benefits? Yes, it has benefits. So, it has benefits, let's get let's have a drink of khamr. 
you know, we've heard recently in the previous years, and it's interesting, it's in France, where there is research that found that having a glass of wine every day is good for you. I told them, rhetorically that is, I knew this 14 centuries ago. Allah says, يسألونك عن الخمر والميسر قل فيهما إثم كبير ومنافع للناس وإثمهما أكبر من نفعهما They ask you about khamr, intoxicants, khamr, wine and all the rest, and gambling. Say, in the use of those, there is a lot of harm and there are benefits. And he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and their harm outweighs their benefits. Oftentimes you hear these things, oh, we've done research, we found good things in this. There's good things in murder too. Truly, there's good things. People find, oh, they get high when they kill somebody. Well, truly people, subhanAllah, that everything, remember what we said about shar? Everything that is shar is relative. Everything has also benefits. Shaitan has benefits. So you hear this, we have done research and found these great benefits in something that is terribly immoral and haram. Is there benefit in zina, in sexual permissiveness and illicitness, and adultery? Is there or not? Of course there is. There are many benefits. But where do we, why do we stop there? Why don't we say, for example, that each year in the United States, Now, one out of every four Americans has a sexually transmitted disease. This is fact. You go to Center for Disease Control, go to the internet, check it out. My information is about from 97 and 98. Every year, every year, there is an, an extra 15 million Americans, 4 millions of whom are teenagers who have a, a specific sexually transmitted disease, I forgot the name of it, which is transmittable. New. Not talking about what it causes of deaths. And of file, uh, disruptions of, of family life and of divorces and of and well, billah and of other diseases and and of that leads you. Uh, that's things that we quantify in the lab. What about what we have learned about the, 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 the miseries of spiritual veiling and of jahannam and of and 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 well, billah. Why do we talk about the aspect of it only? It's scientifically unfair, and it is cheating populations. It's very interesting that in America we make tobacco haram, and I like it. Tobacco, smoking cigarettes, before a certain age, in certain places, it's haram. That's what it is, right? You have it here in Canada too? It's interesting, but it's... <laughs> It's, but it's khamr, it's okay. <clears throat> but to get wasted, it's okay. Ajib. Inconsistency in laws. Sharia is highly consistent. If something is proven quantifiably to be more harmful than beneficial, weighing all the elements of harm and benefits, then it is haram or at least makruh, if the harm is not too much. Or if the harm is equal, I'm sure, if the harm is equal to the benefit, then it becomes makruh. At least, if not haram, in some instances. And if something's benefits outweigh the harms, then it is halal, and therefore either mustahab or obliged or mandatory or, or, or wajib.
please rest assured of this. This is your deen. There is nothing in the deen, in the sharia, that does not fall under this axiom. Nothing. Therefore, the next point that I will address with you is the question of illa. The question of illa. Namely, what uh, may be translated as in, in simple language, reason or cause, the cause or the underlying reason behind um, a legal verdict, a shari verdict of something being lawful or, or not lawful, or mustahab, or bakruh, or, or, and so on. And that means in addition to what we have said already, that there is no piece of law in Sharia that is not intended to promote and protect these elements. And that the analysis has to be literally done in preserving and promoting these elements. In addition to that, the, the, this concept of illa or this concept of direct cause, sometimes they choose words like operative cause, effective cause, ratio, and, uh, and so on, some technical juristic words. Like for example, direct cause I say direct cause as to why khamr is prohibited in Islam. The direct cause is that it intoxicates. That's the direct cause. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and the direct cause, the illa concept, is tied to these questions. When we speak about these questions of universals and and their daruriyat and their hajiyat and so on, we are in the language in the language of the jurists who are talking about al masalih and al hikam. And I said what these were earlier, masalih, plural of maslaha, and hikam, plural of hikmah. Then what we are talking about now is illah, al-illah. Al-illah. And that, in accordance to most schools of thought, I don't want to introduce you in certain... Um, differences among the schools of thought, namely the Maliki school of thought. In most of those schools of thought, the way illa is connected to the hikmah, hmm, plural of, the plural of which is hikam, is that this direct cause which we call the illa is the attribute by which in a direct way we know when this illa exists that the hikmah has been fulfilled. Uh, therefore they say al illa tu mawanna tu tahqiqi al hikmah. Al illa tu mawanna tu tahqiqi al hikmah. The relationship between al-hikmah and al-illa, this, from here we go here, is this. That whenever there is illa, that illa is telling us in a sense that when I am there, that means that this hikmah that the law giver seeks to achieve has been attained. If you find me, I am the direct link to that hikmah. The hikmah for some, in, in, the, in, the, in the juristic argument, could be something that is difficult to quantify. For example, the argument of hardship. How can you quantify hardship? See, hardship is not easily quantifiable, is not easily normalizable, right? Whereas illa, is 
example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, let's take the example of khamr, of, in, uh, of khamr. khamr is haram. And the scholars say the illa of that is contained in the very word khamr. Because the very word khamr literally means uh, to veil. That's why al-khimar, that is sister wear. Khimar, it covers the head. So khamr is that which veils reason. So they say the illa is if you take any substance and that produces takhmir for the aql, it produces um, that takhmir of the aql, that cover of the ability to reason at any extent, then it becomes haram. That's the illa. That's the illa. Um, or for instance, uh, when we journey, when we travel, when we are in safar, huh, and we are fasting, we are allowed not to fast. We are allowed to break our fast. The illa of the permissibility to break the fast during Ramadan is traveling. That's the illa. Traveling is traveling quantifiable or not? It is. But the hikmah behind this is unnecessary hardship upon the person who is traveling. Because traveling is probable cause for a hardship. Do you understand? But hardship is not easily quantifiable. The scholars say. And since it is not easily quantifiable, huh? it can change from person to person, and law needs to be not certain. Law needs to be uh, consistent, yes. It needs to be, it is normative. It sets norms. And you cannot set a norm if something is, 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 is not normalizable. Mashaqqa could be very different. If you say, okay, when there is mashaqqa, there is, uh, you can break your fast. They say we cannot quantify mashaqqa. Therefore, Allah Azza wa built the hukm not upon mashaqqa. He didn't say in the Quran mashaqqa. He said, if you're traveling, and traveling is quantifiable. And that's the relationship between the two. That's another step to further uh, enable the jurists to be more uh, consistent than if they were dealing with something that was speculative and unquantifiable at all. Do you understand? And do you see the clarity of this point? With some other differences amongst other schools that are very, very interesting, but it is not the intent to cover those here. And therefore the rule of law in Islamic jurisprudence is that every hukm Every hukm, every law, and I'm using the word law now as, uh, as, as, as the, uh, not as the concept of law, but as the piece of legislation that is passed and that is enforceable and so on. Every law and every piece of, or every piece of legislation in Islamic law has a illa behind it. Has a illa behind it. And that is in particular in matters of mu'amalat. We have ibadat and we have mu'amalat, sometimes also called as adat, plural of adah. Ibadat, plural of ibadah, and adat, plural of adah. Um, law concerns are of ibadat and of mu'amalat. Mu 
In other words, when it comes to our actions, our acts as human beings, as Muslims in this case in particular, the act, the external acts, they are categorized into these categories. Ibadat and Mu'amalat. Ibadat, examples of Ibadat like Salah, Dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, Sawm, um, and so on. Tahara, Wudu, huh? Ghusl, and Mu'amalat, such as business, uh, politics, uh, trade, uh, social interactions, and so on. Services, uh, whatever, engineering, and wahalum majarra, in which the rights of each other, of the other side's mundane rights, are involved on both sides. Here it is basic relationship between the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without involvement of another human party. Do you understand? Now, when it comes to ibadat, how do we define them also in a, in a more legally consistent way? Well, you find our ulama, rahmahullah ta'ala, and, 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 and one way to put it very clearly, I believe, is on the concept, is when we involve the concept of illa that I just shared with you. When it comes to mu'amalat, all of them have illa. Have illa, the plural of illa. When I say they have, I mean the laws, the laws concerning mu'amalat have illa, have that concept of direct cause involved with them. And when we say illa, and when we say mu'amalat, we mean by that, when it comes to the law here, and pay attention to me here. We mean that the law and the attribute because of which that law exists is rationalizable. is rationalizable. Please understand why I'm saying rationalizable and not only rational. Uh, 